Hello, friends of Red Orchid Theater. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual special event, In, On, and Around the Moors, a panel discussion, in conjunction with our current production, The Moors, by Jen Silverman, which has now been extended until March 6th. Because current safety regulations make it challenging for us to host in-person post-show discussions, we wanted to provide an alternative opportunity to reflect and engage on this powerful show, our first live and in-person full-length performance since we closed our production of Do You Feel Anger early in March of 2020. And for those of you who haven't seen the show, we welcome you and are sure your curiosity will be piqued. Tonight, our talk with the director, costume designer, and two featured actors from the production is hosted by Mark Larson, journalist and author, among other things, of the book Ensemble, an oral history of Chicago theater, which features a brief chronicle on a Red Orchid theater itself and celebrates the comprehensive history of what has defined and anchored theaters like ours in the unique Chicago theatrical landscape. After a too long hiatus, we are proud to be back in action on our intimate stage, where we are committed to your physical safety and our artistic risk-taking. We are grateful that this interim has allowed us to reflect on and activate our mission as it applies to anti-racism policies and a strategic planning process that will drive us with passion and rigor towards our upcoming 30th season. It's no surprise that none of this is possible without your generous financial and moral support. Whether you're a longtime subscriber and donor or a new patron and friend, whether you've seen the show or have yet to join us, we're glad you're here. After our panel concludes, please stick around to hear about the variety of ways you might get involved with our theater. And we hope to see you at the theater again soon. Because, as the character Agatha says in The Moors, all things here are possible. Congratulations on opening. It almost makes me tearful to hear you hear myself say that. Mm -hmm. But you opened. So thank you for reopening. And in such a sensational way, this show is so <laughs> fascinating, so odd. And it's somehow just perfect for, for right now. I, I'm really interested in how you even chose this play and even mm -hmm when you chose this play, because when is such a big concept right now? We were supposed to start rehearsing for this in March of 2020, and we all got sent home about a week before we were supposed to start rehearsal. So we said, well, we'll start in a couple weeks. And then we said, well, we'll start in a few more weeks. And then we said, well, we're going to, we're going to pause for real now. And here we are two years later, or just about two years later, I was really, really fortunate to suddenly have all of the actors and designer, almost all of the designers who were originally committed, still available and excited. And, um, and so we put everybody in the room and it happened. Somehow we made it actually through the whole rehearsal process and tech and the holidays and opening without, uh, without having to make any big significant pauses because of COVID. There's something that this, when we first looked at it, there's something about this play that crosses all of these lines that, that we love to play with at a Red Orchid, which is, which have to do with, um, with certainly uh, utilizing humor, but also horror and absurdity mm -hmm. and, um, and really, really, most importantly, really intense and well thought out and complex human relationships and human beings. Mm -hmm. And then as we started thinking about it post COVID, there's something about the isolation of this world and the ways in which their environment and, and their sense of safety starts to define or redefine their identity their self-identity, their relationships, uh, you know, how familiar a feeling is that that was actually to, to me, certainly walking back in after COVID and how 
suddenly with with theater gone and with um a lot of your social life gone how how does how your identity changes and how all of our senses of safety shifted i mentioned the word surprises before but you do the you give the audience all these notions of where we are or less, at least generally and it's raining and there's a spirit of, of the sp of the space and so forth and that's going along and then emily walks in with stickers all over her guitar and there is this kind of moment of what exactly and so things just are it's just a, a way of like dropping little pieces of strange like little crumbs mm -hmm. of strange along yeah and then this bird comes tumbling in and then the audience has to get used to that oh now a bird is talking too so they have to keep <laughs> getting used to things yeah. and then before you know it there's an axe <laughs> so audrey can testify because we get out there and it's like stiff you know we're acting and everyone's like oh is this a period piece uh, you know and then they're like screaming you know well that's that's the question i i wanted to, to ask you and i'll give it to you emily is um emily i, or audrey, I, I answered <laughs> both <laughs> at you, this point <laughs> you're so close to the audience audrey is in do you pick that up from them? Is there a sort of a gradual picking up on what's going on from them? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, every audience is really responding to the show differently. We're always uh, constantly surprised by where the laughter is or where there isn't laughter <laughs> or um, uh, which audiences really dig, dig into the darkness of the play and which audiences kind of really fall into like the humor of the play. Um, to Dato's kind of what she was saying is there are times where you can feel all the way through scene about scene seven, eight, this like some audiences are taking it very seriously. Like, oh, you are like at, at a very serious play about Victorian England. And then, you know, we get out, it, it, there's just always a moment where they go, oh, wait, this is not the play we thought it was. And then they just fall in by the, you know, by the end. Um, so the things that are out of place, are meant to be out of place. Uh, Jen actually mentions the word anachronism, you know, in in a lot of her stuff. And and one of the conversations we had with designers really early on was, well, are the are the anachronisms there to make sense or to agitate things? And Great I think um, for you know, I, I think what what fun to play with how they can sort of agitate the situation or um, imagination and uh, and so that's you know where we leaned in. Although I have to say, in agitating things, it does make real clear sense of some things as well because yes, the 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 play as Jen said takes place in the eighteen forties ish, but it is very much about right now. There's something about this this freedom of what we know this is a, a kind of a period send up that it it narrows your your focus into what it could be, but also it lets you just kind of find the thing that is that feels right as opposed to the thing that is, oh, we must play it straight, you know, it has to be, you know, in 1843. And we're, you know, um I, there's something that that we know when we need to when something needs to feel um it needs to feel comfortable or it needs to feel uncomfortable. It needs to, to, and I'm, I'm speaking like to the, to the setting and to the, the, the lighting and the, and the sound and, and my work as well, um, where you can go, um, you have that feeling of a, a callback or a feeling of antiquity, but also you can just lean into what just fits in the moment. I've seen in some of the, the press saying that in some ways, this is a departure for Red Orchid because it does lean into this idea of a, of a more period setting and that a lot of our plays tend to be a lot more contemporary. And I, I guess I would push back and, and, and say this is kind of quintessentially Red Orchid in that it follows a journey, um, a path, isn't always 100% logical and always surprises and has some edge. Uh, and, and it's dressed a little differently uh, it, it visually presents a little differently. It fits within the kind of canon of, of work that has been presented uh, in a way that, that feels very much at home. Uh, it feels very much kind of right in the middle of, of what I think we do really, really well. When I read this for the first time, um, uh, I, 
it it felt right. It felt like the right kind of uh, show for us to be working on because it has that moment of, oh, I'm getting near the end and I feel quite uneasy. Um, <laughs> I feel like that happens a lot of the time uh, here uh, with, with the works that, that end up kind of fitting us well. I have to just say, I'm, I'm like, it's, it was so incredible to be part of such a strongly female driven play with a, so many unbelievable creative women um, okay. on the project in, you know, it, it, in all sides of it. Um, because while this is a play about humans, it's about women um, and the roles in society and um, the, what is put upon us and how the free, the freedom that is found in in this very lonely place in a way um and i think those messages come through i, I don't i don't know dato maybe maybe you feel that differently because you never interact with the rest of us and your scenes are um i, I would say probably the mo like what feels to people the the moment of like oh okay we're having these scenes that are also between animals um but i i, I feel like those are the most I don't know people feel so deeply I mean at the end I'm not going to say anything but people just feel you can just feel their commitment and connection to the it, the animal characters in the play so as I'm listening to you I'm realizing that every single character in the play goes through some sort of change like nobody does not have an arc right every there are six different kinds of people or animals in the play and they all grow through a change and Jet, that is a testament to jen silverman how she sort of put, put this play on like a precipice of human nature or nature of creatures i will even say um because um everybody everybody goes through something and and everybody has uh, s something like ma massively huge happen to them, every single character. Because it's it's so not about the Brontes. <laughs> yeah. I think if you know Brontes, there's Easter eggs for you. There's little, yeah. there's, there's little, yeah. there's little pieces that you can click with. The relationship between uh, the Mastiff and the Moorhen feels very recognizable to me oh, yeah uh, almost uh, and almost Human. much more like comfortably like tangible um than like trying to understand like agatha emily or or frankly why would you say that myron why do you it, think that is it, it I agree feels, though i agree i, I mean it's it, it, it's it's less of a mystery in this idea of like oh this person is uh um is uncomfortable with this attention but needs this attention you know, there's there's something there about that about that relationship that feels like i recognize this and i'm not sure if it's from bronte or from a lifetime movie but i recognize something here right <laughs> but then also like for me like i i'm the youngest of three kids and i have two older sisters and there are some there are some agatha and holy moments where i go oh i i remember this fight <laughs> i remember this moment in the back of the van on the way to florida there's, there's moments there that are very much anybody who has two sisters knows exactly what is happening right there and that they have just brought their whole life experience this argument like there is there is so many of those moments there that feel so comfortable and recognizable and then there's moments where you kind of look and you go wait a minute i need a second to un ravel this thing and and you know Mar marjorie mallory is this kind of strange enigma that we have to just kind of go okay okay um <laughs> yeah. right Whatever. So, so there's there there is there are um i'm sure it resonates differently for everybody but i know those are those are places for me that i feel uh like i recognize um more authenticity or or just resonance in, in my personal lived experience i think there's i think there's authenticity to all of this but yeah. uh i recognize kind of pieces of my life experience in those moments and then i kind of have other moments where i can sit down and take that and i have to really kind of pull it apart to find out you know what is what is going on here what are these people about Jen, I think that's one of the wonderful things about this script too, is that Jen 
gave you this character. I mean, there's usually a character that the audience can really like, oh, this is what we enter the world in with, but like she really like gave you this character who is as bewildered by this world as an audience, as a possible audience member might be. Mm-hmm. And and um, I think that's like such a wonderful thing to kind mm-hmm. of hold on to. If nothing else, you could be like, I'm also confused. <laughs> um, you know, and so, and, and discover along with her, the rules of this, microcosm of a world that exists in this strange little corner of the moors. Bedroom, I know you might want some time to refresh, but I couldn't help myself. I'm so excited you're here. Well, thank you. I just know you'll love it here. The bracing air and the strange thorny flowers and the gorse. And there are lots of long walks you might take, although there's quicksand, of course, and also large ravenous birds. And if you walk too far, you might get turned around and lost and starved to death, or you might even be eaten by something. But in general, the moors are very pretty. (laughs) Earlier we had talked about the effect of the pandemic. You know, it obviously abbreviated your, I mean, canceled your original opening, right? And then you came back. I'm wondering, how did that impact your approach to the play? One of the first conversations we had when we came, when I came back was with the um, design team. And we had already done a lot of the design work prior to COVID. But the question that we came back with, which, which was, well, what are the, you know, does any of the architecture, the, the, the outline of this shift or is it the um, the details or the anachronisms or the, and that's really where we landed. Like the, a lot of that design work that we had done early on stuck, but it became more important to me that like being inside was also outside. And then I think the notion, you know, that, that duality and the sense of, of like boundlessness uh, outside in that scene eight on the moors is uh, figuring out how how we get there and how that lives in each person individually, that boundlessness or where it lives what became more important. I don't know if it was only because of COVID or because I also listened to a couple of interviews that Jen Silverman had done and talked about how our sense of safety affects our identity wherever we are. How about the rest of you? Did the pandemic affect the way that you understood this play or played this play? Because it's so inescapable, you know, that and our, our feeling that we're not all we're not very safe right now, and that it isn't boundless for us right now, you know. Well, the hand says, "Is it the typhus?" Like she finally allows the mastiff to approach her and then he says i feel funny and she says is it the typhus so and i'm sure you know it's the same for emily's character we're like the intimacy the actual uh physical proximity of another creature is heightened because of everything that we've been through Mm -hmm. um and my character and the dog and uh audrey's character and another character do get quite quite close (laughs) to each Mm -hmm. other and it i think it does change i i am not in the audience but i would imagine their minds are racing when they see two people close the gap um this the kind of the theme of isolation um, because we all just experienced isolation in different forms. And this play is isolated women, you know, it's like in an isolated place. And how does that affect your behavior and the way that you interact with people and the, and the rules that you make for yourself, you know, rules changed in our society with p- this pandemic and with, um, the way that we now kind of perceive what's important and what we might expect out of our lives and our relationships. We did a lot of, I think that personal reevaluation um, is, is what you see reflected in this play and whether, you know, Jen certainly couldn't foresee a pandemic, but 
um, I find it just so timely. Yep, yep. Um, I just, I think there's so much of what we're experiencing reflected in the experiences of these characters in their loneliness, their isolation, the illness that is existing um, all around them. You know, and if, if, if you do know the Brontes, you know that illness plagued their, the mm -hmm. women of that family. When we very first started like the, so the initial kind of maybe run. <laughs> in 2020. Uh, we, went, we kind of went on pause and we said, well, you know, we'll, we'll do our, our, our normal first rehearsal. I think it was like the original booked time for first rehearsal. We had um, a Zoom reading and mm -hmm. every, I think it was one of my first, maybe half a dozen times on Zoom for any, you know, uh, normal, it was, everything's new. So early. Yeah, mm. right. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the idea of a reading, I was, I was kind of dreading it, but at the same time, I actually kind of like Zoom readings so I can see everybody's faces like right there and not, everybody's not hunched over a table. Uh, but there was this moment at the, toward the beginning of the play uh, where um, uh, uh, Jen Angstrom's character is supposed to like cough really like this nasty brackish cough. Yeah. And she just she just leaned right into her camera and got right in there. And, but, and this was when... <laughs> <laughs> nothing like we knew nothing like we were like we were bleaching our groceries and oh <laughs> right God. woman with this disgusting <laughs> cough just leaned in and went bleh, 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 bleh. and i I was like crawling in my chair and I was like oh god this is gonna if we ever do this play this is, oh my oh, oh it was it was so uncomfortable so uncomfortable and yet brilliant like brilliant that from there on it, it made me kind of realign my entire relationship with like illness and like what is this going to mean because this whatever was beginning at that point uh was going to become was clearly becoming something um and it changed kind of the relationship with the material but the, as far as like the actual production went we had started things without that kind of being part of the world really mm -hmm. uh and then there was this moment of, well, maybe we're pausing for two weeks or maybe we're pausing for two months and maybe we don't know when we're doing this. We don't know if we're doing this. So really just the kind of idea that we're doing again became exciting. Then there was this like, okay, cool. I have this thing and it's, and it's somehow like refined and condensed and aged in a very like good way. Like this is, this is cheese, this is wine. We are aging in a good way, right? Mm. We are developing flavors uh and complexity it, yeah it, it just it, it became I, I feel like everybody came to the table sure of what of the things they were sure of and really curious of the things they were curious of yeah. and i want to say something about working with myron um as a costume designer because this is my first time working with him as an actor um is that you know i had two years to follow more hens on instagram and <laughs> hashtag more hen and so I'm looking at these birds, which they're like, you know, very common birds, but I didn't know what one was before I was suddenly playing one in a play. And they're water birds and but they're not really chickens, but they have they have similarities to chickens, but they have similarities to ducks. But when you're working with a designer who like who's at the caliber of Myron, you 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 know he'll bring you your drawing right but then you don't really like you have to just sort of keep your mind very open and sometimes like as the actor you don't really know what's going on like you don't know like myron's very very considerate and he showed me this headpiece right away and he's like i think do you want to try this and i'm like yes i want to try but then like it you know it changed and it grew and then it had a, a big bun on it and then it had feathers and like you know you know and so you just have to sort of keep because finally i remember one day i was talking to kirsten or maybe i was talking to myron and i'm like Kid, is there like do i know like what's coming next like are you going to tell me because sometimes you don't know sometimes you just come in and they're like oh now here's a feather it, 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 it's really um terribly fun and exciting because you just don't know what what's going to happen next i would say that it grew with like you informed a lot of what that became for me because like the the initial idea I think even the way that I, I, you know, when I, when I read plays, I, I hear, I hear them in my head in a, in a certain way. And then to get the actual, this happens with everybody, but I feel like in this, in this case, like you shaped 
mm. what this kind of what is the tone of the Moorhead and like the overall idea is you know here's the <laughs> colors and here's the overall shape and here yeah and the others is gonna be yellow feet and what you know whatever else it is but then kind of the 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 spin to it becomes much more integrated in in your kind of your um, take on what it is. Myron, could you say something about uh, how you arrived at the, at the Mastiff then, same way that you did with the Moorhead? Yeah, I, I think uh, all the all of the initial things came from um, ideas of period clothing. Uh, and then for, for the ladies, uh, I'd say that some of those got kind of overlaid with more fashion-y things. And some of them just became very like literal, like what is this character? This character is like for, for Emily, like there was something about that lace that became very fragile to me, but I, but the, the kind of pointy edge of things yeah. became significant in that she had, you know, she, we eventually learned she has edge she has teeth so in some ways that's kind of like literal bonk you on the head design that i would probably tell my students not to do but in some way it kind of works uh for, for me yeah. in this other space but for the animals it was like okay where do we start with a a silhouette that feels recognizable in some way or like cl clothing that maybe feels kind of recognizable but then where do we lean towards a shape that has more animal quality to it uh and so i had to kind of look at you know, what is a mastiff uh, what are the what are, what do we associate with them kind of color wise and like I, I was lucky to find the the fabric that I made the the vest and his pants out of is like this beautiful gray brown velveteen and that's what those those dogs had that kind of beautiful gray mm -hmm. brown velvety you know short short coat and uh, the other thing I wanted to click in with him was um, I didn't, we, were, we were trying to figure out what to do about makeup. I like how, you know, are we doing, we're not doing animal faces. We're not doing, so like the very, the very gesture that, that, or the very kind of gestural thing that we could do was kind of give him this little red ring under his eyes. Yeah. Because of that kind of, that, that kind of jowly thing that we get with those, those kind of heavier face dogs. Squash and scrub. The uh, squash crab, yeah. Uh, and the thing that that just kind of made me so happy, though, like the first time uh, guy tried it, because I, I could tell he was kind of like, I don't know about this. The first time he tried it, I was like, oh, gosh, it makes it makes your eyes look so beautiful and blue <laughs> when you have this little bit of red underneath. And then I was kind of like, oh, this and that that for me does like dog things of those dogs. Mm -hmm. that have those like creepy human eyes and can can look into your soul uh and and there's <laughs> something that made that kind of just you know I, I did it for a different reason and then it's exciting when it works I, I so admire well first off you see in this cast the ensemble nature of of this piece of work including Myron's work and, and the music and everything else and a lot of that, the way that comes together and the way you work together is, is really a wonderful thing to see. The collaboration mm -hmm. is still happening, is happen it happens through opening and through the run with our audience. Being able to step back into the room with audience in the room came with all of the the nerves and joy that it should. And I I hope that um that audiences get to experience that too, you know. So as as they arrive at the space, quite literally, someone will ask them to show them their vaccination card and and an ID at the front door. Then they will come through the hallway in into our lobby, uh, where they'll check in and get a little slip of paper that is their ticket and a QR code so that they can access the program, which is now electronic, which is new for us saving some trees and reducing, you know, touch points for safety uh, reasons. They might notice that in all of our spaces, there are uh, new HEPA air purifiers, yeah. small one in the lobby and two much larger ones inside the theater. Glad that you mentioned all of that because I was, I had trepidation not going into, into your place, but um, just going to theater, do I really want, am I really ready for this? Yeah. And it was very comforting. I mean, it's you. It you feel like the theater knows exactly what it's doing at every step. You do. You can't miss the air filters. Not that they're obtrusive, but they're there and they're comforting too. Everybody is masked. It's it's a great experience. I can't tell you how much it's meant to me 
to talk to you all, especially after seeing it twice. It's a spectacular show. It's a great way to come back. I so admire what you do and I'm so grateful for it too. It was a privilege to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by and reconnecting with us at a Red Orchid Theater. What a pleasure and privilege it is to welcome you back to our Coliseum of Creativity, putting ourselves out on the front line of what's possible in an intimate theater experience. I joined a Red Orchids board as a deeper dive of my role, passionate audience member. The quality and caliber of performances delivered in an intimate 70 person venue, amazing. There is no place to hide, only to engage. Our Red Orchid Theater is true purity of the acting and performance art. We live to create intimate theater experiences that engage our audience through thought provoking, edgy, risk taking productions that raise the bar for what's possible in a personal theater experience. As we reemerge from the pandemic, join us for a truly worthwhile experience that will enrich your own life. There are so many ways to engage with us that I wrote about them in my diary, just like the character of Hudley in The Moors. Monday, buy tickets and see The Moors. Ticket costs are only $30. Tuesday, Support a Red Orchid Theater through a season subscription cost of $60. Wednesday, make a tax deductible donation. Thursday, gift a subscription to family and friends. Friday, become a corporate sponsor. Saturday, bring your best clients to a performance. Sunday, become a volunteer, board member, or join a Red Orchid committee. Every day, tell your family, friends, and colleagues about a Red Orchid theater. And consult your own diary to find your own interesting way to want to support a Red Orchid theater. We hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for your time and support.